Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone, again. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk about something that I really enjoy talking about, recently at least, this is blockchains. Now, um, let me start by asking you, and may I ask you for your hands, who's, who would say is familiar with blockchain technology? Okay, that's about a quarter of the audience. So, I hope I can give you an explanation on what blockchains are. This is an attempt, and I try to do this slightly different than probably some of the other perspectives um, that are around on blockchains. We have um, April 2017. It's impossible not to notice all the hype and the discussion going on around blockchains. And so let me introduce a bit why is there such an interest in blockchain. Is this actually justified? And given that, that we are a cloud research and services research community, let me take a perspective on what we've studied so far over the past decades and years, which is transaction processing from a database and distributed systems perspective, including the cloud perspective, and how blockchains will then actually relate to that. Okay? All right, so um, a study by IBM end of last year among 200 banks or so basically concluded that around 15% of those banks are already on their way to fully um, offering commercial blockchain products in the course of 2017 of this year. And I alluded to this in the panel earlier, the adoption rate of blockchain technology, and we'll cl clarify in a minute what blockchain technology is, is much, much faster than what we've seen in the past with other technologies like the cloud computing, for example. Um, also interesting, um, again, in the financial sector, is a recent study by Accenture published earlier this year um, basically states that blockchain could save investment banks, the global investment banks are really uh, meant here, with up to 12 billion a year in infrastructure costs. So blockchain, as we'll hear in a minute, is really a tamper-proof, permanent, immutable record of data. Given that you have such a record, such a... Um, immutable record that obviously in particular in the financial industry um, changes the game completely for auditing processes, for finance reporting and so forth. And with that, an, an enormous cost savings are being associated um, along those lines. Um, nevertheless, it's uh, not related or uh, not, pardon, it's not restricted to um, uh, the finance industry. In fact, blockchain is a technology that has um, um, gained interest across a number of industry verticals. And it applies really to any application where there's some form of trade going on um, and where some form of tracking of some digital asset is really of, of interest. And of course, in some cases, maybe actually a physical good, a physical asset, then we didn't need a digital corresponding part to it. But the opportunities are immense. And so current um, experiments um, basically range from any their digital rights to micropayments to e-identity, all aspects of uh, supply chain. Whenever there's information needed about the provenance of some good, of some um, digital assets, this is what blockchain is about and why this is so promising. Um, also interesting to see the investments that have taken place in the blockchain startup uh, market. And this is not just related to Bitcoin. So uh, blockchain was originally introduced in 2008 um, as a technology behind Bitcoin, but it's, it's of course not restricted to Bitcoin or even uh, to cryptocurrencies. Um, over the past two years, over one billion of US dollars have been invested in startups. So each year in 2015, 2016, the investment were over 500 million just in startup technology. And if you look at the broad range of what's, what's going on, even for, for us, for example, in the cloud community, we have um, offerings that tend to look at cloud storage in a new way, let's say at decentralized cloud storage. Um, but we have, um, of course, solutions uh, popping up in IoT space, in a classical enterprise domain, uh, in addition to the application-specific solutions like in the finance or in other industry verticals. So the potential for blockchain is very real. This is not just something that people are writing about, even though, of course, there's probably a lot of um, discussion and potentially even hype around this. But correspondingly, um, it's not trivial to actually implement blockchains. And even though the, um, the speed of how blockchain technology is, um, is developing and, and uh, as a number of also experiences are, are growing with blockchain technology, there's still a number of open issues. And um, hopefully I can contribute a little bit to this by um, giving you a viewpoint on uh, blockchain by 
taking a transaction processing perspective. So about a quarter of you said you know what blockchains are. And the next question I will have actually is, who are you, in fact? Because depending on who you talk to, there will be different definitions of blockchain coming up. So one is um, what typically a business executive or an application developer perspective would be about, which says a blockchain is really a shared decentralized ledger. Uh, with the purposes of business disintermediation, so remove the middleman, remove the, um, the central unit, and thereby introducing trustless interactions or trustless architectures, and thereby lowering transaction costs. Okay? So trustless is a term that is, um, relates so in the same spirit to when we say in computing something is serverless. Serverless doesn't mean there's no server, but it just means we don't care and need to manage the servers anymore like we do in cloud computing nowadays. Um, so like here, trust is nothing we want to explicitly and expensively manage, but we'll build it in basically in a, in a key architecture, in a key paradigm. That's the main idea behind here. By re removing the middleman, be it um, a finance transaction or be it a peer-to-peer -peer trade of energy or anything else that like, that's a huge promise from a business perspective. Now, if you ask an IT architect and a database guy or distributed systems guy, it will slightly change, possibly. And a definition could be, it's a shared append-only database, a distributed database, with a full replication and cryptographic transaction permissioning model. Right? So the language gets more technical at this point. And you see, OK, it's an append-only database. We have full replication, and we draw quite a bit on knowledge of what replication has been in distributed systems and in cloud computing. And we introduce some cryptographic elements and protocols as well. And again, we have a transaction notion here, a different transaction notion than for the first definition, and it gets more technical. Then. And even yet, a third definition would be if you go to the actual blockchain developer and uh, um, technology community, and they would probably say it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for trustless execution and recording of transactions, secured by asymmetric cryptography in a consistent and immutable chain of blocks. All of these three views are identical, but all of these put a different emphasis. The first one obviously looks at what the opportunities are in the business space. The second takes more an architecture perspective, and the third one gets even more technical. And correspondingly, if you talk to any of these communities, you will see such a different focus. And there's even more communities. Um, if you go to a security guy, a security guy will, will um, bring in a different element. If you talk to an um, economics per, uh, community, again, the, the notion will change. The definition that I would like to put up for us here in the cloud research community is it's a shared database system where no single party can modify any record without the consensus of all network participants, and in doing so, enables decentralized control and immutability of transactions. Now, these are quite some powerful words in here, because the technology, what blockchain claims to be able to do, is not something that typically is easily achievable with alternatives. All right? So a shared database system, OK, agreed. We're familiar with that. Consensus protocols, we studied them for a long time also. Fair enough. Decentralization of control makes it already qu quite different. That's not trivial. And immutability of transactions, thinking of all the discussions around, you know, um, data pr uh, pr privacy or um, any data record and potential uh, um, attacks that may exist to such records, this is quite an interesting claim or cl quite a strong claim that blockchains promote. So probably we need a bit to digest this um, because it's quite a bit of a claim because if this were true, that justifies what I tried to motivate in the beginning, why from the larger global investment banks to the smaller startup um, um, market, basically, numerous parties are incredibly interested in blockchain technology. So um, we've seen in definitions, in all definitions, the notion of a transaction pops up. So what exactly is a transaction? And my suggestion is, so let's take a transaction processing perspective. Let's look from a transaction and TP perspective on blockchains. And I'll be talking to you mostly from now on as a, as a computer scientist and as an IT architect. And uh, the message I'm going to give to you, it's all about SALT. Okay? And we're going to um, um, decipher what the acronym SALT actually stands for. First of all, what, have, what are transactions as we know them? And um, 
most generally in, in, in common language, it's an exchange of transfer of goods, services, or funds, or it's actually the act, process, or instance of transacting. So whenever I'm giving somebody something to somebody else, or the two of you are doing this, or even more of us, that's what we typically refer to as a transaction in the English language. For in, compu in computer science, uh, we have a slightly more restricted definition. And typically in computer science, we refer to a transaction as a logical unit of work that is being performed within some information system that we refer to as a transaction processing system and for which we can give a set of guarantees. So that logical unit of work is typically given some guarantees on properties by the system that manages it. Right? So in the 80, 1980s, early 90s, basically, with the emergence of relational database systems, um, and most of us probably were not computer scientists by then, um, Jim Gray postulated the, the term asset transaction. I'm sh I'm, I believe that everyone is familiar with the term asset transaction. You probably don't, uh, can't, can't avoid this in hearing this term either when you're studying um, computer science or whenever you hear about this, uh, looking at relational database transaction. And it's a term still very um, important today. And asset stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these properties that are typically described in here, they are not necessarily trivial to be ensured. So atomicity, uh, in a given transaction, like a funds transfer, we have a um, withdrawal and a deposit, we'd like to couple these and either execute both or none of them. Sounds easy, but it's not necessarily trivial to do so. Consistency refers to maintaining the referential integrity of the database, that only valid data can actually be written in the database. Assuming the initial state is consistent, every transaction would lead to another initial uh, consistent state. And isolation can retreat a number of concurrent transactions if they were executed in, uh, as if they were executed serialized, so in isolation. And given that we have successfully committed data, that data should never be lost. These are asset transactions, and of course we could you know, go, go deeper here and, and discuss what asset transactions are really about. What happened in around 2000 and, uh, is the term base systems and base, and the term base was, um, um, I think, initially introduced by Eric Brewer to deliberately describe something that is diametrically opposite to asset, and that's why you have asset and base. Okay, Slight analogy to, to chemistry here or lemons and baking soda. Um, and base stands for basically available, soft state, and eventually consistent. And again, to us as a cloud community, um, I assume you're probably mostly um, also familiar with the base notion. Basically available means that partial systems, system uh, failures are okay, okay? Soft state means that the system state can change even if no further updates are happening. Eventual consistent, refers to the system becomes consistent if no new updates are being made. So all of these are, again, just like with ACID, worthwhile um, to study in more depth. But this is what typically cloud storage systems are mostly characterized by. Any NoSQL system is typically not an asset system, but is a base system and refers to the base properties. And this is heavily drawn, of course, by the notion of um, um, replication and how to ensure and set high availability as a primary objective in the base world as opposed to um, putting the emphasis on consistency in the asset world. So as you can see, within base, things have been quite compromised in a way. The other interesting thing to notice, though, is that with um, asset, we're referring to properties of a transaction, whereas base really refers to properties of a system. Um, and uh, that's not really a notion of a base transaction, but any, any logical unit of work that would be processed within a base context could be considered a transaction. And let's try to be a bit precise here, though, because uh, by trying to explain what blockchains are, we'll, we'll need that dual perspective. And another way to look at asset versus base is that, um, if you recall the CAP theorem, that you can only have two out of three properties consistent consistency, availability, and to uh, tolerance to network partitioning, then on the then asset, the asset world, the lemon world, is really drop um, availability, but ensure consistency in a partitioned environment. And this is like, like the wedding, 
Right? So this is typically assured by a client talking to a coordinator and a coordinator running a two-phase commit protocol, just like in marriage, asking in two phases first, do you like to get married? Do you like to get married? If you say yes, then yes, you are. Yes, you are in the second phase. Okay? Um, whereas in the base phase, um, the emphasis is really drop consistency, but focus on availability. And here, we don't ensure the consistency, we don't, ha we don't have a coordinator anymore, but it's really just do the update with one node. We have some um, responsibilities distributed across the nodes, and then ensure that the nodes talk to each other by basically promoting and, and propagating the, the uh, respective updates. Um, and we'll have a look shortly what blockchains are then. So if you look at... Um, um, transaction processing then from asset and a base perspective. Um, this is um, basically an illustration of a technical picture of, um, of a TP system in support of asset transactions. It's a bit simplified and uh, in computer science we have plenty of um, um, standards included or um, protocols that relate to such TP systems. For example, the um, XOpen distributed transaction processing standard that defined also the XA interface is um, decades old. The same idea from the previous picture. We have a particular coordinator element, which is called a transaction manager. Any application that is interested to do an asset transaction would need to talk to such an element. That element drives protocols, um, completion protocols, resource managers that talk to the actual interfaces and the client in, in number two interacts with these, but any transaction is under ex typically under explicit demarcation. Okay? I'm showing you this picture to contrast and explain what blockchains will be. Um, if you look at base systems, we don't have the transaction manager component anymore. Just like as in the previous picture, no coordinator exists. In this case, the application talks directly to the resources typically through some form of load balancing, and then the resource managers will need to talk to each other in order to synchronize. So if there's an update done to this data record and a copy is being held at this version, then they need to synchronize eventually over time um, and independent of the application, right? All right, so let's look at blockchains now. Are blockchains asset or are blockchains base? And the answer is actually they're neither. And this is why um, even though um, Asset transactions are very established, and so are based with NoSQL stores. The, the term I'd like to coin here is that blockchains are sold. And so thinking a bit about our old chemistry days, it's also a contrived acronym, but you take an asset, you take a base, and the result um, is actually a salt, plus water. But, so this is a, a bit of a contrived acronym, but salt stands for sequential, agreed, ledgered, and temper-resistant. Okay? Also, we probably need a bit to digest what these terms mean. But the idea is that transactions are being processed in a sequential order. Um, we refer to this as community consensus that determines whether a transaction is valid or not. So there's actually an agreement protocol in here. And everything that is validated, all agreed on transactions, then are, be are consistently stored, uh, uh, permanently stored. Um, so this is why we call it a ledger property. And the transaction cannot, cannot be easily, um, and, and the data records cannot easily be, be manipulated with, simply because we use a set of crypto protocols and other mechanisms that ensures that whatever data is being written is, is tamper resistant. So the emphasis, as opposed to asset and to base, is really on these properties. And whether these properties are relevant to your application or to what extent you can actually benefit and, and derive value out of these, that's the exercise when, when engineering blockchains. Now, um, there's a perspective, the dual perspective here, also that relates more to the system side. So um, understanding transactions conceptually is one side of the medal, and understanding the systems that would support the transactions is the other side of the medal. So, um, we use the same acronym SALT, and we um, basically um, have a slightly different version here, in that from a systems perspective, we say SALT stands for symmetric, admin-free, ledgered, and time consensual. Um, the, the background of why we've, we're doing this is simply because asset transactions are also more, also more properties of the transaction, and base systems are properties of the systems, so we can easily also then or better compare uh, in what 
relationship um, um, blockchains will like, are actually towards asset and base. Symmetric is very close to what we have in base systems in, in uh, uh, NoSQL stores that, that use a um, replication architecture. The idea is that we have a peer-to-peer -peer network where each node has similar or shared responsibilities. The difference is we, know we don't have any admin. In some replication architectures may also be the case that there's no admin, but being admin free is quite a strong element, right? This is exactly what we discussed in the panel. There's no central coordinating agent anymore. Everything is being decentralized. Um, still ledger, um, and this is a similar but different uh, version of the ledger and transaction. Everybody maintains a copy of the database. This is quite important in a blockchain context. And time consensual, there, we can give some guarantees in actually in terms of how the transaction, um, which is a block in the blockchain world is a, um, um, a set of transactions, of validated transaction, um, is actually being executed. Right? Taking all of this together, um, we have a quite new concept here with blockchains. Um, the key idea is, and we've talked about trust earlier this morning, is there's no need to trust anyone. The main idea is trust yourself and only yourself and then assume the system consists of people like you. So, if everybody just trusts yourself and agrees on these protocols, that's the idea of a blockchain. So no centralized agency, no centralized control, no third party trying to say we have a higher right or we have um, a, a, some legislation to actually govern trust. All of this disappears through these properties. And while it's easily, I think, easily and to some extent, at least I think it's nice to um, describe blockchains from this perspective, this would be the systems um, picture to that, the corresponding systems picture. And you can see it, it is quite different. This doesn't look necessarily like the asset diagram. It doesn't look like the base system. It comes with a bit of different sets of components and responsibilities. So we have an application that talks to a number of peers, or, in the, or ideally to, can talk to any one of all of the peers. Typically, this is the data that I'm managing. I have some sort of an equivalence to a resource manager and some sort of an equivalence to a transaction manager, um, and different interfaces and responsibilities. I can create a transaction, start a transaction. Um, transactions are then basically validated. Everybody has, however, the right to validate, so transactions are propagated to other nodes, which in turn also validate the transaction. And only if the, there's different ways to, uh, for consensus algorithms or consensus to be achieved, um, proof of work, proof of stake, there's different uh, mechanisms here. If how the majority actually agrees, then a transaction is being uh, written and can become permanent. A block is really the, uh, the unit or set of transactions so that the, the, the unit of processing is not too fine granular. Um, and can be appended to the actual resource, which is then held as a copy at each of the peers. With all of this, and there's more information on this um, that we could discuss, um, 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 we have also written a short paper that uh, should be part of the proceedings, uh, where you can read up on some of this um, in terms of the processes that are going on. The immediate thing to notice, though, is this is not ACID and this is not BASE but we keep talking about transactions. And we look at application context nowadays, uh, be it in the financial services domain or in other domains, and we say, well, let's do a blockchain-based transaction. It requires to us a change in mindset. It requires us to look different, both conceptually at what a transaction is, as well as at the systems that are in support of such transactions. If we try to compare a bit the world of asset, so traditional relational database systems transaction, and the world of base. All of this is our NoSQL cloud storage well-known world. Then we have um, our salt environment in the middle, which are the blockchains. And you can already see where um, blockchains actually draw from the history of relational database management uh, transactions, as well as from all the experience we have from cloud storage and NoSQL systems. Um, we'll defer the A, Atomicity, for a moment. Um, and yes, you can already see everything, every letter that's, that's in red in here doesn't really have a direct corresponding part, whereas everything that is uh, written in, in black 
has to some extent some relationship to another property in a different system. So the consistency property um, in asset transaction has some relationship to the agreed property in, in blockchain world. The isolation property does re relate to the sequential property. The durability relates to ledger. Uh, this ledger is a bit weaker than this durability. has to do with over time things actually could change. But um, in principle, they relate. S same over here for the base uh, cloud world. Basically available relates to both the symmetric and ledger aspect that we have in the salt world. And the eventual consistency notion uh, does also to some extent relate to the ledger world. Um, it's important to say, though, that base properties are actually not really any guarantees because it's, it's relaxed in every matter. Um, we don't say high available, so we say basically available. We say soft state, we, we don't say consistent, we say eventually consistent. So all of these are not really uh, strong guarantees. Whereas with here we describe actual properties and on the left, uh, uh, on the left side to the asset, actual strong guarantees that are not trivial to support. Tamper proof, time consensual, admin free, these are very specific properties to salt that don't have a direct correspond corresponding element, and this is also what makes salt systems different, in addition to being in relationship and drawing from history both in the relational database world and the NoSQL world. Now, what about the A, though? So, the idea that we have transactions that group a set of operations and where we can um, ensure that uh, an all or nothing uh, property through that element. Um, Maybe the T in SALT could also stand for Turing complete, right? because the A, this is the A from our asset, um, could be addressed by looking at stored procedures. Stored procedures, as we know them from the relational database world, and by then um, we don't have just data in our blockchain, but we also have um, executable programs in the blockchain. However, in order for the blockchain to become of the nature that, that, that we just described, um, all of these stored procedures, they will have to be deterministic. If they were not deterministic, we can no longer ensure the properties of a database. So we can't use stored procedures, but really have to go towards deterministic computation. And then there's essentially two ways to address this, and one is what Bitcoin is doing um, by simply having a reduced language instruction set on how to express those proced procedures so that all computations will be deterministic. And the other one is what the Ethereum world is doing. Ethereum is a, is a different uh, blockchain um, uh, other than Bitcoin uh, by introducing a cost model. By introducing a particular cost model to a, for a Turing complete language, you can ensure also that sooner or later basically the computations are deterministic. Otherwise, they would become too expensive and from an economic reason nobody would do them. And this is really what smart contracts are. Right? So even though we hear about the notion of smart contracts, there's a very specific smart contract notion and definition that comes out of the Ethereum world. This is not, in, this is not as smart as used in intuitively uh, uh, in different contexts. So this is quite fascinating when we say that, um, okay, our shared append-only database does not just contain data, but it also contains executable code. So why then blockchain and not transaction chain if transactions are really the unit? So a transaction is what every peer in the network can contribute to the system. Um, a block is really a group of validated transactions, and the blockchain is then an ordered set of blocks. A block also contains a number of different other information, all of that, again, for the purposes we described earlier, uh, typically in um, are any of the SALT properties. So, um, I hope I've given you some introduction into blockchains, which is uh, different than, let's say, reading a white paper that just claims how brilliant blockchains are, or um, this is a perspective we've taken um, on blockchains from a distributed systems and a database perspective, um, because I believe this is, um, for um, a community like this, the most appropriate perspective. Now, how do we build systems that use blockchains? And how do we engineer blockchain-based applications? And um, I picked uh, a couple of examples um, which are not deliberately not from the finance industry to show you um, basically um, 
just exemplary, um, um, so a couple of startups that do something different. And Monograph is, um, is a startup. Uh, we have no relationship to them, by the way. Um, it's, it's just interesting to observe what, what, what is going on. Um, that um, address artists, um, um, be it either in the music industry or in, 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 a, in the fine arts uh, context, um, by, who have digital art and like to actually bring them on the market and sell them and have, of course, uh, both the rights management be managed as well as the actual trade be supported without you know, any, any um, larger um, corporation that would govern such a trade. Um, it's an interesting case where you can see that Monograph um, can benefit from blockchain technology. This is happening real world. Um, and um, for, to describe this a bit, we, we just use um, yeah, sort of simplistic, simplified process diagrams here. But the idea is that an artist or a media creator would create artwork, would then register the artwork and list it in a catalog. Um, the media owner basically has a number of um, activities and in the middle is what we're interested in uh, in this particular context here is the data management. And you can see that in the case of Monograph, they actually use two different blockchains. They use um, a Bitcoin-based uh, blockchain for payments and they use an Ethereum-based blockchain for um, owner history who actually owns the digital artwork that is being um, subject of um, um, interest here. And they also use uh, Couchbase and uh, AWS S3, to say conventional NoSQL stores, for the art portfolio and the sales contract. So quite an interesting use case where we see that the um, data management um, uses different data management technologies, including established traditional cloud technologies, in combination with blockchain technologies, and even two different blockchains in this case. Um, and again, it's, it's worthwhile to look sometimes into some of the applications and how they really be done. A second up, um, example I'd like to say, tell you is a company called Providence. And uh, in this case, we actually do work a bit with Providence together. Providence is a company that um, tries to tell you the provenance, um, the way um, your food that you're consuming, that you're finding in a supermarket or that you're eating, where it actually comes from, right? So um, they had an interesting uh, case study a few um, couple of years ago, basically looking at um, uh, yellowfin tuna that is being caught in Indonesia. And basically from the moment the tuna fish is being caught, the fisherman writes a digital record into, into the blockchain. In real, in, in real it's actually not into the blockchain, but into a, another system that would then be mapped into the blockchain. And the entire way from Indonesia, from the fisherman to the actual location of where you um, can purchase or consume your tuna would be traceable. Again, with the idea of having an immutable data record. Nobody can manipulate and tell you that something was broken in between. And there was no central agency that you needed to trust. And somebody just told you, well, this is safe. This is fair trade. No, this is not happening. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer system. Now, if we look again um, then at provenance, um, um, we can also try to draw a picture like this. And we see we have a fisherman here. We have a supplier. We have a factory. We have the point of sale. And again, we have um, data management in here. And you see different activities uh, starting from registering a catch to you know, tagging and shipping and scanning and different activities. It's, of course, again, it's a simplified picture. But it's to illustrate, again, how does the data management look like with provenance? They use a blockchain by Ethereum. A blo uh, Ethereum-based blockchain, and then they have a traditional, more or less traditional ERP system um, and a traditional relational database management system. Okay, and again here, the data management is not exclusively blockchain. It is also not exclusively asset transaction or exclusively base. It's again a combination of this. So. And there's more interesting cases, and I deliberately chose two um, which are not in the finance industry, but of course in the finance industry we see uh, probably the, um, have the most maturity in, in the uses of blockchains. Now, if we take these three pictures, this was the asset diagram, this was the base diagram, this was the salt diagram, um, and we've just seen that typically um, a combination of these is in place. 
and people are, will be using our applications require a bit of everything. Now we said this is acid, and we have particular properties associated to acid. On the other side, this is base. It's a highly available system that scales to, to, web, um, to modern web demands, to the highest web demands. In the middle, we have saw, what we said, we have trustless interactions, you know, that basically come with a set of properties. What if we take these together? What's the overall property, actually, of the system? Um, will a combination of these still be salty? Or will it be just bad taste? Or is it well seasoned, so to say? This is subject to exploration, and I would like to invite you as the, as the cloud and research uh, community also to, to look into aspects like this. So what are the actual properties of um, blockchain-based systems? We are at an early stage in, in, uh, in understanding how to engineer with blockchains. So the key points to take away is um, blockchains are very real. This is not just um, a hype that popular magazines um, and bloggers write about, it's actually really happening. A lot of investments are taking place. And um, I'd like to suggest to you to uh, think of blockchains as being sold. So they are sequential, agreed, ledgered, and tamper-proof from a transaction perspective, and they're symmetric, admin-free, ledgered, and time consensual from a systems perspective. Blockchains Transactions and blockchain systems are an alternative to asset transaction-based systems. They have a different TP architecture and they have different consequences on the application architecture. Right? And I've briefly sketched that many applications will actually use a combination of asset, base and salt, but the overall properties of such systems are yet to be explored and what we can ensure, what we cannot ensure. So I hope I did raise your interest um, into blockchain technology and let me do a bit of adver my advertisement to the end. I'll be very brief. So if you're curious, if you're passionate and if you are, uh, have a research and engineering mindset, I would like to invite you to collaborate. Um, we will be even be hiring very soon. You probably all have um, um, excellent jobs, but maybe, maybe not or maybe you know somebody or maybe you're interested to explore more. Um, we are, we've been just granted a project by the economics ministry where we're going to look at, um, so to say, a blockchain blueprint for photovoltaic um, energy systems. The idea is that individual homes who have a photovoltaic system on top of their roof, for example, they're no longer just consumers of energy, they're also producers, and, they, and, and of course, in a setting like this, um, and a decentralized architecture is, is, is the key where direct trade among either those parties or even other energy providers um, will take place, and this is where we want to explore blockchain technology. And um, another activity starting is we are in Berlin, of course, one of the uh, hubs in Europe for uh, any IT startups. Uh, we'll be starting a blockchain incubator. Um, again, the notion is IPOs are history. Uh, of course, they're still taking place. But what's happening in, in a blockchain world are ICOs, initial coin offerings. Completely new ways to think of organizations and how to start your own company um, uh, for whatever purposes you're going to be addressing. Um, we're planning to build a crowdfunding platform for blockchain-based solutions, um, looking at the, also extending the, the outreach community and um, possibly in doing this also with you. So um, happy to discuss both with you. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions.